Bill, I, I think I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 117 of the Stroke Cast. If you're looking for a book, gift, gadget, or gizmo for yourself or the stroke survivor, caregiver, or other person in your life, be sure to visit the StrokeCast gift guide at strokecast.com slash gift guide. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different. You can think of it more as stroke adjacent. Dr. Nian Chang Ong is part of the team that developed a mobile CT scanner for ambulances and aircrafts, which is pretty mind-boggling to think that that giant machine can fit in those vehicles. The idea is that EMTs can take scans of patients before they even leave for the hospital. This, of course, can absolutely speed up stroke diagnosis and treatment. I, I first learned about this uh, device through a Google News Alert I have uh, running, and so I reached out to him. And then I learned about the amazing work that his wife, Dr. Tin Tin Kine, is also doing in caring for patients. See, after her mother died from stroke, Tin Tin and, and Yen uh, designed a physical system for facilities to support patients and family members as the patient goes through their uh, final days and, and weeks. So we had an absolutely fantastic conversation about their work in medicine, in palliative care, in industrial design, and in art. And of course, we talk about how this power couple in Melbourne, Australia got together in the first place. So now, let's meet Nien and Tintin. So I guess my first question, Yen, is your website describes you as a design expert at the intersection of mobility and health. What does that mean? <laughs> well, you know, industrial design, my, my main practice is quite a broad area, right? Like, so by default, every industrial designer almost has to become an expert in an area. So I've been, essentially right now, my design and research today takes place mainly in two categories. Design for help of people inside a moving vehicle as evidenced by my PhD project, which was an aircraft cabin that helps passengers sleep better, and the design of medical technologies and services that are mobile, as evidenced by the mobile stroke scanner, which we'll talk about today. Yeah. Uh, how, how would you go ahead and define industrial design? <laughs> that, I think, may be the most complex question of the day. <laughs> and <laughs> look, unfortunately, many people today would still assume that the answer is making things look nice, right? Uh, now, that's not true anymore. Many industries and research um, all over have learned to, learned to appreciate design at a deeper level now. But industrial design is far beyond that and far more complex now. But I think for the sake of the audience today, I might sum it up to two things. First, industrial design means that the way the product looks is the product itself. Second, industrial design is the form and physical interface between people and the technology or service that they're interacting with. Let me explain. Your first and foremost interaction with any built object, whatever it is, is that which is emotional. Your brain in a snap moment decides whether something looks safe or not, whether you like it or not. And if an object doesn't get past those initial snap judgments at the first go, it's nearly impossible to make that person change their mind and want to interact with the object. So the way the product looks, its affordances, its signifiers, what it promises to do through its form and visual cues represent everything else about it. That's why I like to think of industrial design as an interface that allows you to have a relationship with a product, its technology and services. And what an industrial designer does is champion that connection with a vast toolkit of methods and technologies so that your relation and behavior with a product is a desirable outcome. Okay, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, in my background, I typically come from 
the opposite end of the pipeline in the sales and marketing space. Hmm. And one of the things I keep telling people when I teach sales is that people don't buy anything because they need it. They buy it because they want it. And you have to help them establish a positive emotional connection to that product and what it is going to do with them yep. in order for them to be for it to be successful. Yep, absolutely. The uh, the negotiation expert, uh, I, I forgot his name, the FBI hostage negotiator. He's written a book, a fantastic book on uh, negotiation, and he has a great line: "When does someone give you their money? When they feel like it." <laughs> it that's exactly it, and. And the other thing I teach people is you also then have to go ahead and ask the customer to to buy it because people will want to buy, yeah. but they don't want to be sold to. Chris Foss, by the way, Bill, is the name of the author. Awesome. I, th I Actually, I think I have that book on my shelf, yeah. so I will definitely include a link in the show notes. Yeah. So, why did you pursue industrial design? What was it about this field that really engaged you? Well, I'm originally from Myanmar, and Myanmar is not exactly somewhere you would think about when you think about design, right? Like, because much like many of the older cultures, it's been somehow, somewhere, we decided that much of what we do is craft and not necessarily design. But of course, objects are very much a part of human existence, really. And I've always been creative. I've always been interested in art, but I've, there's always a side of me as well that doesn't just want to work in 2D. Although I love it. Please don't misunderstand me. Um, I love illustration just as much as the next guy. There's always been a part of me that wanted to build things in the real world, things that we could live with. So over time, when I came to study in America in high school, I came across a video about Buckminster Fuller, who's primarily an architect, but there were some work that he did that could be considered industrial design. And that's when I started looking into the practice and just fell in love with it. And I've, I've made my career out of it. Hinton, you've proved a different path with uh, a focus more on going through the medical field. What was it that in in first brought you into the medical space? I think my um, inspiration stems from a personal experience um, when I was really young. Um, similarly, I think I should probably start with a cultural context. Um, I'm also originally from Burma. And in our country, um, family units stay together. So, for example, you know, in under one roof, you'll probably have two or three generations living. So I grew up with my grandmother from my maternal side. And one day, I was probably around nine or ten years old. I remember she basically got sick. I remember she keeps vomiting and vomiting. And I was quite close to her, feeling quite helpless as a, you know, like a young child, thinking, oh, what can I do to make her feel better? And I remember the moment that my um, uncle, who's a physician, walks in and then he just press on her tummy and then say, oh, this is pancreatitis. Your grandma probably have gallstones. And I was just thinking, how do you do that? They're like, oh, we're going to take your grandma to the hospital in a nutshell. They found gallstones, removed them. And in a few days, she came back home. So to me, that um, experience was like the highlight in my life. Like, oh, well, you know, like you can, um, I've always interested in like art and, you know, um, creative creativity as well. But that really draws me towards um pursuing clinical medicine, thinking, well, if I choose a profession that could help people, um, particularly, you know, helping your loved ones, um, that could be a very useful experience. So that's like the summary of my inspiration to getting into clinical medicine. It's, it's those early experiences that have such a powerful impact on the courses of our lives. Yes, yeah. it is. So... When we talk about helping folks through design and bridging into this medical f field, I, I want to talk specifically about the mobile CT scanner uh, that you worked on. Uh, so, so, Nian, why did you choose to pursue this project of taking this giant piece of gear uh, that makes way too much noise and uh, fitting it into a mobile context. Right after I finished my PhD, the aircraft cabin, uh, my mother-in-law, Tintin's mom, and her family came to stay with us in Melbourne. 
during just for a short visit. And during the visit, one night, um, my mother-in-law had a very large stroke, and we went. The decision was made very quickly that you know she would be going to palliative care. And I remember that experience so vividly. And I remember waiting in there. There's just a community hangout sort of area. And so far right now, I've been so busy with trying to organize this, trying to organize that. That was like just a minute that I just had to, I just had to sort of like think to myself. And my little niece was there uh, and we were just hanging out. And suddenly I just had to start like, you know, I've, I'm, I've been someone who's been built my way out of trouble my whole life. Literally, like with assignments, with things, I, I've just built my way out of things. I've made a career out of it. For the first time in my life, I found myself not being to build anything at all, right? Like this is not something I'm going to build my way out of. And that thought started crossing wires in my brain about building and designing and medical and things. After the event, essentially two projects came into our minds collectively, Tintin and I. Um, the stroke imager is one of them. The palliative care designs are another. But I, right after, right around that event as well, I started working for a lab called Monash Design Health Collab at Monash University. We've always collaborated on things together. My PhD was part of the lab's outcomes, but Monash Design Health Collab is quite a unique lab or design studio where we work with leading clinicians, scientists, engineers, and other researchers to design and develop cutting-edge medical technologies, products, services, and systems. In, in other words, it's a lab where design takes a leadership role in delivering translational clinical technologies and, and outcomes. Um, coincidentally, around that time, one of our professors, Professor Murray Caymans, met with a company called MicroX in Australia. MicroX is the only company with who who currently offers carbon nanotube X-ray technology based uh, imaging systems. They've got a product called Nano, which is a very portable X-ray machine, and they've been thinking about using similar technology to Nano, these miniaturized X-ray heads, to to really um, put in a put their hands up and put in their application on mobile stroke imaging. Now. If, as you know, and I've looked through stroke casts as well, mobile stroke units are not necessarily a new idea. They've been, people have thought about them since the 1930s. And there are some units in the world right now, I think a bit over, a bit over two dozen. And, but they're all running around this large CT scanners. Micro eggs with the, with their technology, thanks to carbon nanotube X rays, believe that they can, they can essentially miniaturize all this technology down to, down to something so portable that it could fit into your standard road ambulance car, not the giant MSU model. And uh, we started having a conversation. And MicroX, of course, is a company that really, really appreciates and puts design forward. And it was just such a natural relationship. And we started working on this together. Well, I think that's one of those things that can be so important. I mean, you know, in my local community here, I mean, when I had my stroke, it was about a five-minute drive in the ambulance from my home to the the hospital, the uh, comprehensive stroke unit, uh, and I had my choice of hospitals. But when we start looking at some more of the outlying areas, it can be a lot longer or you got getting to some of the more rural communities, then it can take a lot more time. And I think there's a, obviously there's a lot of benefit to being able to diagnose an ischemic stroke very quickly to push TPA or something else to start treatment earlier. So that can make a big difference. Yeah, major. Uh, as you know very well, when it comes to stroke emergencies, it's all about time, right? And that decision, it's very critical to have that imaging as rapidly, as quickly as possible, and as clearly as possible. And MicroEx is just a terribly innovative company, and they, they've really, they're really looking into some of the most advanced imaging technologies that, that, I, that I've ever seen. And I'm so thankful that they've decided this is an area they want to look into. And I'm even more thankful that they wanted to partner with us for that. 
And while my knowledge of Australian geography is fairly limited, my understanding is basically you've got your major cities uh, <laughs> at the very edge by the water yeah. and a whole lot of nothing in the middle. Yeah. Uh, so. so, Bill, here's how I tend to describe it to, to my American friends. Australia is roughly the same size as continental USA, but there's only about 20 to 25 million people occupying the, the entire landmass. So I think that's a population of New York State that would be occupying the entire United States of America. <laughs> But it's, it's a wonderful country. Um, for the mm -hmm. amount of people we have, we're terribly, terribly innovative, lovely people, and I, I really like it here. So with these mobile units, then, one of the things that struck me is that it's very interesting that you can actually then put them on aircraft potentially as well. Mm. So I guess one of the things that comes to mind is I also then – recall just driving anywhere in these bumpy roads i know when i had my ct scan in the hospital in the big unit laying down they kept telling me i had to hold absolutely still how do you manage that with uh this scanner yep. in combating road movement or air turbulence yep. from the various vehicles yeah uh it's actually reasonably straightforward uh the plan right now is not to scan in transit. With the system we're developing, again, thanks to cold emission and carbon nanotube x-rays, there's still heat up time. And because the scanning is happening quite instantly, uh, well, it, the scanning is done in an instant. So what will happen is the patient will be loaded onto the vehicle or, or depending on what type of vehicle will be housed under the scanner. The scanning will happen instantly. The patient is loaded and transported. Okay, so you can go ahead and do the scan while parked to uh, get the patient secured, start on your travel to the medical facility yeah. while you're transmitting those images back to the neurologist who can make care decisions while you're still in transit. Exactly. So that, that, that makes a lot, a lot of sense then for, yeah. for managing that. Um, so I think I can't wait to see more of these types of things in the uh, in in the uh, ambulances and other facilities we have here in the U.S. Yeah. and elsewhere around the world. It, you know, Bill, the the system we're working on. I I know we call it a, a stroke CT as well, but it's really, mm -hmm. to be honest, like it's it's perhaps not the most appropriate name for it because it's not it's not a redesign. It's not a modification of an existing machine. It it relies on the same principles of stroke imaging, but it's a wholly new kind of technology. It's just the the system, the the way it scans, the way the images are processed. It's a very different piece of technology, and it's something that's geared directly for stroke. So, so what is different then about that imaging aside from just the location you can conduct it i i want to be careful here because we we do have industry partners as well that we're working with but essentially your ct technology has a detector source and an x-ray source that spins and spins and spins to record everything we have a system that's designed without a lot of mechanical movement um, with, with basically no mechanical movement in the imaging and we have a system that doesn't doesn't really need a lot of heat up time. And the entire thing is tuned to look for the stroke, the, uh, the, the nature of the stroke in the brain. So everything mm -hmm. is stripped back and pared down and refocused and retooled specifically and exactly for stroke. That can then not only detect the um, bleeds, which we typically detect with exactly, CT, but it can also optimized to also then identify more yeah. clot-based strokes so it's, as well. It's, it's really optimized to tell you whether there's, there's blood or no blood in the brain. And of course, while this technology can absolutely help a lot of folks and uh, potentially save lives, reduce long-term disability, coming out of this experience with your mother-in-law, with 
the palliative care solution. That's sort of the opposite end of the hospital stay. Could you talk about the experience that led the two of you to design the uh, palliative care unit? Thanks for asking that question. Um, I, I'll try my best to summarize it. I think as Nian has explained earlier, um, a little bit over two years ago, my family basically came to Melbourne for a short holiday visit. Um, and during the visit, um, my mum um, had a a stroke, which is the second time big stroke for her. I, I should really say that she's a very, she was a very brave lady. She had mentioned that to us very early on that if she had any type of medical condition that looks like she's going to live with a disability or very poor quality of life, she would prefer palliative care. So in this setting, when she had her second stroke, which basically made her, we call it quadriplegic, meaning that all four limbs, all both arms and both legs are basically dead. She couldn't open her eyes or even speak. When we get to the emergency department, the decision was swiftly made to um, consider palliative um, care. So I should say that at that time, I was uh, working as a, a trainee um, for endocrinology. So I basically live like five minutes walk from the main, um, one of the main major metropolitan hospitals. So it's quite a convenient distance for our families to go and visit. But what we have learned is in the hospital system, as, as much as the staff is wonderful to provide end of life care, in terms of the infrastructure and design, we don't really have for even like furnitures or things for the family to be spend time with the, their loved ones at the end of life care. And I should say that, um, again, we are very fortunate to get, for example, a single room within 24 hours. She got a bed in a dedicated palliative care space. However, in, in our culture, again, you know, like coming back to the cultural context, when someone's passing, we do not tend to leave that person alone for both daytime and nighttime. At least one or two person um, basically hang around to support this end of life, even if the person is, you know, like shifting in and out of consciousness from, you know, from the medications that she's receiving from palliative care. So what we have found is... um so, for example, majority of the night shifts or majority of the times with her, I spend time with her and Yen has been very kind. He came along with me and you can imagine the scenario that there is a single room, there is a bathroom and a little porch that people can go in and out. There is a sofa that um, someone could sleep on turning into um, like this small bed. So, but the other person doesn't have anything to basically sleep on. So basically Nian slept on the floor for the total of five nights through that journey. And during that time, um, you know, when we were going through, of course, the end of life and the grief process, we both had a chat and we thought to ourselves, well, we do have the space in the hospital. We just have to see, you know, what, what else we could do to make this more of a human connection um, and family togetherness better in this end of life. So that's like a, 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 main, a main, the main summary of developing these palliative care units. But in this current um, COVID-19 pandemic, as you know, uh, you know, the whole, in this whole world, we have been dealing with a lot of um, lonely deaths very sadly. And at the beginning of the year for the first six months, um, I'm a, to give a bit of a background, I also specialize in endocrinology and aged care. So I was doing, um, work in aged care where we are like mobile units that we drive out to aged care homes to look after our patients. And I have witnessed, um, sadly so many basically lonely deaths in the setting of COVID-19 pandemic due to um, physical and social distancing. So what we did is on top of developing a physical, um, you know, like assistance for family connectivity, we quickly um, try to put our effort in this digital module where if someone is, for example, in a nursing home or in the hospital or even in their own homes, if they are limited, you know, visitors or family members, or they could be around the world, whether we could use this digital module to facilitate the connectivity. So that's like the summary of this um, palliative care modules. Well, I think when you started talking about that digital connection, that becomes so much more important as everybody is just spread out yes. from their families more than ever before. I mean, even in your uh, your specific circumstances of uh, making home in Australia with having uh, come from 
Myanmar and uh, having family spread around and just being able to try and help establish some of those connections. Technology makes things possible Definitely. in a way that wasn't before. Definitely. And along with, as you know, with the current restrictions. So, for example, Melbourne, in Melbourne, we still are under uh, very strict um, restrictions for the pandemic. So, if, for example, um, we have very limited hospital visitors. But if someone's passing or dying, we do have some allowance for family visiting, but majority of the hospitals only allow one person at a time, one hour at a time. So you can imagine that the end of life experience at the moment is very, very challenging for our patients in the community. So we really hope that um, this digital connectivity module could um, help people connect and ease the, you know, ease the pain and the grief that people are going through. Absolutely. And especially for a lot of folks who may on, may not or not only struggling with their own end of life challenges, but also may not have been as technically adept for managing video chats and things like that before. Being able to prepackage that in a simpler solution Definitely. can make and a big difference. We do realize that there will be limitations. For example, if someone's passing through towards very close to the end of life, they may not be able to you know, operate this um, digital unit. But majority of the time, what we're hoping for is if, for example, like one family member is there because other family members couldn't come in, they could communicate with each other. And I'm I'm sure you would have um, probably seen it you know, across the world that there's a lot of aging population living in aging homes and basically logistics of going in and out is very limited you know, with the goal of um, containing the virus. So what we're hoping to do is, you know, yes, these modules are currently being designed and targeted towards palliative care, but we might be able to expand its use towards people who are, for example, confined to a space. You know, it could be in a nursing home, it could be in an independent living unit or in their own home to be able to connect with their loved ones from the outside world. When we look at the way COVID-19 exploded across the United States, the first well-known surge of it was actually through a nursing home mm. in the Seattle suburbs yes. and such a high risk population uh, that we need to do our best to take care of everybody because it's not just the people there, it's the visitors, it's the staff and trying to protect folks and keep that under control as much as possible. Definitely. It's a very similar scenario in Melbourne as well. Majority of the people who have lost their life is from the um, people who are living in residential care or aged care homes. And there is um, more than 2,000 healthcare staff who have, has been infected with um, COVID-19 in the last um, six months. So it's a major, it's an ongoing issue, I believe. And when we talk about those aged care facilities, those nursing homes, those subacute facilities, a lot of folks in the stroke community either have spent several months there uh, before they're ready for rehab or depending on the extent of their disabilities, regardless of age, may find themselves living in that environment. Definitely. Uh, one of the other things that made a big difference for me when I was in the hospital for a month was uh, that my girlfriend was actually able to stay in the room with me. Mm -hmm. And on one of the, I think it was actually engineered to be the single most uncomfortable roll away bed you could possibly design. Right. I mean, we're grateful that they had that, but it certainly wasn't comfortable for her when she's dealing with the added stress of having to deal with me when all, all I have to think about is I just have to focus on getting better. She had to think about everything else. Right. Yeah. It must be very hard. And I'm very sorry that you had to go through the journey, but thank you so much for sharing that. It's a very important message um, for other people to hear as well. It's very difficult to deal with um, stroke and disability. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're going to include uh, some some links to some images of this palliative care unit. One of the other things that's really neat about it is you're also including different shelves and storage in that for people to populate with their own personal items. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the importance of having those personal items in the room with somebody who may be going through palliative care in a hospital. Yes. I think 
First, the first thing that I'd like to highlight as a clinician is, you know, sometimes when we see a patient, we tend to get bogged down on medical issues. And sometimes we forget that we're all humans. And like, um, you know, all, all of us have their own specific needs. So for example, I always imagine that if I go through my end of life journey or even an illness, like you have mentioned, you know, if I have a stroke or an illness that, I, that will require me to stay in the hospital as a longer stay, what would I want? Um, and my thinking is what I want would be very, very different from what Nian wants or like what you want. So having, um, these, personal items such as you know photograph it could be some trinkets it could be some books the things that that remind the a person of who they were before um, it's very very important and again that is supported by literature as well so as you know um, putting this project together we um, when we try to do the literature review there's so many um, scientific and you know supportive literature saying that it's so important that when someone is going through an illness or like a long-term disease journey or end-of-life care it's so important that we have all these um, could be objects or images that remind them of who they are to be able to make their experience as humane as possible so that's one of the main things that uh, we thought of um, and again coming back to our personal experience um, you know hum human and service experience was um, very lovely everyone was supportive but we only had for example one little small um, I wouldn't say like a shelf like a bedside table and you can imagine that I was working in that hospital as well so for example my colleagues were sending us you know little flowers and all sorts of like cards and we remember vividly that we have no space to put that in the room so what we ended up doing is fortunately you know I live five minutes walk away from the hospital we ended up sending it to our home um, and the other thing for example like um, in terms of making the experience much nicer you know it I'm sure you remember in the hospital we have all sorts of coats and alarms going off at the same time so <laughs> we try to for example play some music so we bring, you know, like a, our phone and a speaker, even to have that um, type of, you know, I wouldn't say changing it, but toning this, you know, hospital experience down to a more personalized and human experience. We just believe that we just need to have some, um, you know, like spaces that we could um, put things on. Um, so that the, you know, the, the person or the person staying with the, the patient could have a lot more humane experience. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, as we were talking about earlier with sleep being so important, yeah. it's amazing that a hospital is probably the absolute worst place to it get is. any kind of decent sleep. It yeah. is. It's very, very difficult. It's a constant battle, um, you know, amongst, for example, like, you know, like how you correctly said, shelves. And the other things that we also want to highlight in our unit is um, we also have these um, blue depleted lights um, put in in the both of the module, the physical bed module, and also in the um, digital connective D module. Because our thinking is when a patient or a person is sleeping, um, if someone needs to go to the toilet or, you know, for example, take a cup of water you don't necessarily need to turn on these really bright fluorescent lights which is important for our clinical examination and procedure but these things are you know it seems very subtle but they are very um i would probably say could be very intrusive and could be very discomfort cause a lot of discomfort for the patient so that's why we try to put all of these things together as Nian was saying what he has learned in his PhD you know simple things light you know how could we make that as natural as possible ideally it will be lovely to have you know wide big windows you know from roof to um, you know for, from ceiling to the floor but as you know majority of our hospital units don't have it how can we make the noise of the surrounding a lot more toned down from from the devices that you put in and the third part is to be able to personalize the room or the space for the person and the family yeah well at the same time being able to make it easy to sanitize in yes. between 
patience and keep everything clean. Yes, that's that's like one of the major things that we have to think through now, particularly with this, again, COVID-19 um, pandemic context. You know, what type of material are we going to use um, so that, you know, because we have to be cautious with, you know, all, every patient who come into the hospital um, or even in a residential care, I think in any context, um, basically, because we have to be careful of whatever that we're bringing in. It has to be, um, you know, like uh, at the moment, as you know, you know, science, is changing every day, but we have to think through what material would be the most ideal one um, to be able to clean. The other thing is false risk. As you know, the patient and the family, you you don't want clutter in the room um, because you don't want people to, you know, um, trip on it and then cause increased risk of falls, particularly like you have mentioned, you know, if someone has a stroke in um in a hospital and you know that the chances of the patients having falls from imbalance is very, very high. So we have, we, we're still in the process of thinking through all that and when we are designing these modules. That's, that's fascinating. So as this experience with your mother has certainly led to some innovations that will help an awful lot of people, how is this experience also impacted the way you do your job as a clinician? I'll probably say a, a very significant amount. Um, previously, you know how like, and I'll admit to this, we, we all work in a very busy system. And particularly for me, I have been working and been trained in the you know public hospital, which is fantastic. But as you know, we're very, very time poor. So majority of time, the times, as I have mentioned in the past, we are always more, I, would, I wouldn't say more trained, but our thinking is more focused towards a medical condition, right? Medical scenarios, medical issues. But after having this experience sitting on the other side of the fence, make me always think um, things holistically. So if I ever interact with a patient or a family member, I would now, I think my brain will allow me to think holistically to say, look, this is not just the medical condition that we're thinking about. We have to be very careful of how the patient is feeling. We're just not talking about the emotions because the the, the, the experience itself is part of the journey. So I'll probably say that it has really opened another door for me to to help people combining, you know, physical health along with the emotional side or mental health or even the, the whole experience, personalized experience. Um, it's a very important thing which I have primarily learned. It's that whole person going through this experience, not just the problem in their brain. Correct. So, I mean, the two of you are this this team of pairing the industrial design and the medical background to provide these solutions. I, how did you meet? <laughs> uh, Tintin says I should tell this story. We have known each other since we were kids. We weren't exactly friends, but we've known each other. Uh, we didn't live too far away from each other. We went to the same schools. Um, she claims that I liked all her friends except her. Which is not true, Bill. Uh, let me just be on the radio, uh, on a podcast, saying that out loud, which is not true. Um, I, I just, we'll just skip right over that one. Anyway, <laughs> um, I left for America for high school and college. And after getting my industrial design degree, um, I came back to Myanmar for, for a short while. And that's where Tintin saw me and she called and then we started talking and we started hanging out again. Um, I, obviously people can look very different from when you knew them when they're 13 and when you meet them again when they're 21. And Tintin looked especially very, Especially after spending that time in Seattle. <laughs> especially after spending the time in Seattle. Uh, Tintin looked very good to me. And I was very <laughs> interested and I was also very impressed because she is terribly intelligent. And she was already a fully qualified medical doctor by then. Um, and here's the thing. Look, it's a while ago. I was very young. So there's going to be some things that are inappropriate. I apologize, but <laughs> the story's better this way. Um, Fantastic. We started hanging out and I was interested, but I wasn't at the time, if you will, exactly in love with her. I was, you know, I, I was hanging out 
and Scrubs was a very popular TV show at the time. And me being very dumb and my brain being very, very immature, I believed in the possibility of getting some action at the hospital. So, <laughs> I went to visit her at the hospital, like completely, you know, like really totally ignorant of what a what a hospital ward in a Southeast Asian um, general hospital would look like. So, I go in and this is for the first time that I'm actually seeing an area of actual dire need. So, I step in and I'm this, I arrive at a ward and it's this experience of um, deer in the headlights. People were uncomfortable. People were crying. Uh, I had imagined that there might be an on-call room where we could, quote unquote, hang out. Let alone an on-call room, many patients didn't even have beds. There were people lying in the hallways on bamboo mats. Um, and while I was waiting for her and she's running around doing things, I hear way in the back, way in the dark, a mother scream. Just, and I have never heard a mother cry because she thinks her child is dying before. And it was a real, all these alarms were going up and I'm frozen. I don't know what to do. And I couldn't see the patient, right? Like, and people there, it's, I'm not saying they're bad people. Like they've just become so, so naturalized to this environment that not a lot of people were even moving to attend. And that's where Tintin came running in. She runs into the dark and with some help, they're bringing this kid out. And for the first time, as he enters the light, I see the child. And I've never seen anything like that before. Today, I've learned that that's called Steven Johnson syndrome. And it's a very, very adverse reaction to epileptic drugs that could happen. Um, fortunately, Design Hub Collab is actually working on a technology to help with that as well. Uh, but the, when I saw that kid, it wasn't, it wasn't the most cuddly sort of scene and, and it was downright horrifying. But I saw Tintin going in, caring, providing care, taking for this kid, just full of love and compassion. And I realized at that moment that this woman could love anything and I count as anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, that's the very moment I fell in love with her, and and I've and I've been absolutely content in this relationship, and with her as my partner since then. So, so Tintin, Ten, what's what's on the other side of that story? <laughs> <laughs> oh, because we're on the radio, like Nian said, I probably would mention, but he did like all of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's it was a it was a very challenging situation for our country, um, particularly at that time. Now I'll probably I haven't been you know like been back home to do clinical work for more than a, a decade now, so it's hard for me to comment. But when it was during my internship at the time, what Nian was saying, and that was during um, my pediatric um, rotation in um, in a major um, tertiary hospital. So what he said was true, and I still remember that day. Because sadly, um, that patient, we, we basically lost that patient after mm. a few days. Um, so when, when he was saying I was, we were taking this patient from one place to another, I remember we were carrying this child to a high dependency unit. And I still remember that the high dependency unit was full. So we, we have to do with what we have, but it, it was very challenging. I was very, um, thankful that he came, but um, in reality, I didn't even have much time to interact with him. But I guess, you know, all of these experiences make who we are. Um, and we're hoping that um, we could contribute more to the society. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with I uh, don't necessarily uh, have the time because it would take like days to get into it. But for those who haven't looked at history, I know Myanmar has had... Mm -hmm a very tumultuous uh, political environment over the last uh, 10, 20, 30 years yes. and even longer, which of course impacts everything. Yes. Uh, it's been a very, very long journey for all of us. Yes. Mm -hmm. So why, why did you choose Australia and Monash University as a home? I left home um, in 2008 after we had a very big um, political unrest. You may or may not have seen it on TV where we had a like a, a, a very big protest from the monks, um, peaceful protest that turned out to be quite a sad situation where 
a lot of the you know pol- political problems happen. So I have I left the country afterwards. I initially traveled to the Caribbean to Jamaica because I initially wanted to be a HIV um um med- medicine specialized physician mm. because I worked like a HIV related research projects in my second year right after I graduate. But in the working in the Caribbean again give me a different type of experience and, and you know makes me think of what because you know like choosing a specialty is something that most people would end up doing for another you know 20 30 years so working in um Jamaica allowed me different experience but you know like seeing a lot of younger patients dying with um HIV or AIDS was a very difficult emotional um, journey for me so I just decided you know what I love the subject but I can't I can't continue <laughs> practicing this way I'll probably end up crying every day so I've decided to um, pursue for different specialties and in the meantime Nian was in um, Sydney he was also a student he was trying to finish his um, industrial design degree there and I'll have to say he was a very persistent um boy or men he was only like 21 22 boy boy still a boy (laughs) um both of us were adolescents um you know we both didn't have you know i want to be very honest didn't have much money at all um because as you can imagine a junior doctor salary in jamaica is very limited and he was being a student in sydney we're very thankful that his parents were forking out everything that we have but you know we we don't have a lot of cash to spend on other things but he would like spend his um holidays time you know for example christmas to New Year, he would work um, throughout the time, save money, and he came to see me twice in Jamaica, which I was very, very impressed. So he basically say, oh, why don't you um, consider trying Australia? Because a lot of the internationally trained doctors go to the uh, United States to continue with your fellowship training from the Caribbean because, you know, as you know, the geographic um, location is very close. The training is also quite similar. There were a lot of um, American trained specialists in Jamaica. So that was my intention to do US Emily and come across to the States. But when Yen said that, I'm like, okay, I'll give it a try. So in a nutshell, took some time off, like an annual leave, went to Australia. As you know, we had to do all these, um, you know, boards exams or like qualifying exams during the annual leave, did all that. And I'll probably say through multiple blessings, I passed all the exams um, in one go and it was very, very fortunate. So in a nutshell, um, I finished my contract in Jamaica. So I worked there for a year and um, came across to Australia. And very soon after, I also got into the base um, physician program straight away. Um, and also Australia was very kind. The year that I did in Jamaica was counted towards um, basic physician training here. So you can mm. imagine that I didn't have to waste Basically, any time I came across, you know, did my qualifying exams, get into the program straight away. So in my mind, this is how I think. Look, I'm originally from Burma. No one knows who I am. I could barely speak English because we learn medicine in Burmese or Myanmar back home. Because you can imagine that, you know, textbooks are in English, but all the patients you communicate with Burmese. But even with a very, very, you know, like minimal language skills that I have, this country really open up and accept me as who I am and they were like I met all these mentors multiple mentors in multiple specialties who have really raised me up so I, I I'll probably say that that's part of the reasons that I have we both have called Australia home mm-hmm. and apart from doing medicine I'm also an artist so I've always loved to like paint and create things and I find that living in a country where we have freedom of speech is a huge a huge deal for me, to be honest, Bill. You know, when we were back home, you know, like in, my family is very supportive, always allow me to, you know, talk and think, you know, the way that I am. But at schools and even in the universities, it's very, very difficult to live without freedom of speech. So that's another thing that has really fascinated me. So in a nutshell, I initially work, worked in Tasmania and then came across to Melbourne, did my basic training. And I've always wanted to come to um, the States for my fellowship. And again, through many um, support and blessing, I got, uh, we both actually got scholarship from Melbourne to come and spend. I spent a year and a half in Seattle to do my endocrinology um, fellowship. And Yan could also spend a year um, while I was there in Seattle as well. So we, we, sh- we, you know, thinking back, you know, why wouldn't we? stay in a place where first, you know, the people has welcomed us 
as who we are. You know, we basically came with bare hands and, you know, they have accepted us. For for example, now we both are Australian citizens now. Um, and I should say that I'm currently 35 weeks pregnant. The baby could come any time. So we're like, okay, if we have oh, to wow. choose... <laughs> If we have to well, congratulations. A, thank you. If we have to choose a place, you know, where do we want to raise our child? We would love to, like, for example, you know, go back and, you know, like live back in our country because both of our families are back home. We have no immediate family in Australia. However, you know, we, we've got friends who are like our family here. And we thought to ourselves, well, if we could give one chance to our child, I would love to, again, um, for you for the child to be live in the environment, number one, you know, where in a, in a place where it welcomes everyone. And again, freedom of speech, to me, that is a very important, um, important aspect of my life. Yes. Um, yes, but Monash University, um, I have been, when I came to Melbourne, the hospitals that I have worked in, as you can imagine, it's a different system from United States where, you know, in United States, you go somewhere and you stay in one place for, you know, three years of residency and then you do your fellowship, same thing, right? Two or three years, but you stay in one institution. Here in Australia, as you have, um, you know, rightfully pointed out, we've got, uh, multiple, um, cities spread it across the Bay areas and we, we, we have a huge contrast between, um, metropolitan and rural medicine. So what, um, the system has allowed us to do is basically you have to move every year so that the doctors are being trained in different settings and different health networks and we have to do a lot of secondments as well so you so that you don't just work in the city hospital and not knowing you know what what the rural medicine um, would be like so I was primarily trained in Monash University affiliated hospitals and through my mentors um, like we both have got significant support so that's why we have um, basically decided to stay here I, I mirror Tintin on why we live in Australia, um, but when it comes to Monash University, I mirror Tintin again as well. Uh, Monash University is one of Australia's largest universities. It is highly innovative and um, so many facilities and resources that, that for someone like me could really thrive in. Um, within Monash University, Monash Art Design and Architecture, my home is pretty much where I feel like home, right? And I think that's the best compliment you can give to your work organization is that I feel home with you. Uh, within that silo, I think Monash, Monash Design Health Collab, the lab under which I work, it's an amazing place. I'm, I am just absolutely enthralled with my two lab directors, Professor Daphne Flynn and Professor Mark Armstrong. Right now, I think many labs around the world and many businesses are supposed to be one of the toughest times ever. And yet, Design Health Collab has been so well managed that we're busier than ever. One of the other things I saw when I was looking at uh, some of the videos you shared was you, the video of you, uh, of Nguyen sketching Tintin in a cafe <laughs> that is now on a tram traveling around the city. Yeah. Uh, how, how did that happen? Bill, I, I think I'm the luckiest guy in the world, right? Like, I mean, I, I love my job. I love my wife. But where I think uh, I might really push in is Tintin is my muse. I, I draw her quite a bit. I paint her quite a lot. Um, in fact, I, I think for the last five, ten years, she's possibly one of the only, no, but the only um, female figure that, that I've drawn. Uh, I'm someone Good where, save. Yeah, no, I, uh, thanks. Um, I'm someone where my reality and my fantasy gets to blend in my art. The tram project came about um, about five years ago. Uh, Tintin was again at the hospital, getting off one of her shifts, and it was pretty late, right? Like we're almost midnight, and we were both hungry, so we decided to go get dinner at somewhere called the Supper Inn Chinese Restaurant. It's one of, it's an institution in Melbourne. It's 30 years old. And this is a restaurant where, you know, like it's not glamorous from the outside, but when you go in, you'll find five star chefs coming in. You'll find celebrities. You'll find businessmen, like people of all kind, from all walks of life coming in to, to eat there. It's just a beloved sort of place. We got a seat right in the middle that night and Tintin was drinking tea and it looked very fun to me. So I took a photo of that, but it just sat away for a while. Uh, then there's this, sometime later last year, there was a Melbourne Art Tram program, which is a very iconic art program in Melbourne where part of the Melbourne International Art Festival, the festival commissioned artists, I believe 
12 artists to 12 or 8, uh, I forget, sorry, uh, 12 or 8, I forget. Like, they commission artists to put their work on, on, on these trams that are going around the city for the next six months. I had just finished reading uh, Walter Isaacson's autobiography on Leonardo da Vinci, and I was in love with the chapter about the Last Supper. So I decided to paint that scene with Tintin in the middle, just borrowing from the composition, but that's it. The rest is all uh, people in Melbourne who are enjoying dinner at Sabrin Restaurant. That went up as an EOI. I put it as an EOI, and I was very fortunate to to be selected as a launch tram, and, and I've just been... I, I, it's probably my, one of my, my favorite art project so far. It's, uh, right after the tram went live, friends started sending us tea as present to the house. And one day, <laughs> Tintin's going like, why is everyone sending me tea? Like, how do they know I like mm. tea? While there's an entire tram, 20 <laughs> meters long, with the image of her sipping tea going all over town. Fantastic. And we'll have some links to that in the show notes as well. <laughs> and by the way, the Supper Inn Chinese restaurant does have four out of five stars out of 517 Google reviews. So that's pretty darn good. Yep. <laughs> so are there any other personal favorite projects that we haven't talked about yet? I would give a bit of a shout out to the camping gear company that I work with, Austin, Australia. I, I think camping gear is not as high tech as some of the other things that we're working on. But what I learned about portability, usability, durability from there is direct knowledge transfer between everything else that I do. Absolutely. And I think a lot of things when we start talking about that, too, with some of the innovative design, the different ways of doing things. A lot of that can then benefit uh, things around accessibility and accessible and universal design and yep. those those other things. And that brings us to our hack of the week. What I would like to, again, come back to, um, similar to what I have said before, is when someone um, has a disability, either from a stroke or a medical condition, again, it's my personal view, but I feel like a lot of the times we tend to focus on the physical side of things. So for example, you know, in, in you know you might have an arm or a leg or both, you know, one arm, one leg not working. Some people might have, you know, some balance issues, secondary to stroke, or some other forms of disability. But I feel like the way that we practice medicine and the way that we look after our patients, we tend to forget the um emotional or you can use the word psychological or mental health part of things. So I want to if I could say one thing to the community, I want to say that, you know, like us as human beings, it's a connection between mind and body. And yes, it's important to, you know, focus on the phys the physical side of things to recover. But it's so important that we pay attention to our mind, which is nowadays, you know, we are making a lot more aware of our mental health. And both parties of that health um, component needs to be balanced and, you know, like, helped and supported or treated together to be able to have a good, I wouldn't say a good, but I'll probably say more like a, a recovery journey, a lot more pleasant. So if I could summarize one thing, you know, please don't forget about your mind and your mental health while you're living through disability. And it's not going to be sadly like a linear relationship where, you know, you do a, and then, you know, you get to point B. Most of the time, the journey could be very fluctuating, like the ocean or the sea. And we just need to find ways to support and to be connected so that people could, um, you know, have the best quality of life in whatever time that they have left. That is a fantastic way of uh, sort of wrapping things up here. So if folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? Uh, I have a uh, university profile page at Monash University, and I also have my website, www.nyanong.com. That's just my name, N-Y-E-I-N-A-U-N-G.com. Tintin also has an art website where she, where she regularly updates her artwork, and that is www.contraindicated.me. Contra the only thing is I haven't done much because I've been pregnant. <laughs> but, yeah, it's that is a perfectly valid excuse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Contraindicated.com. Sorry, like, contraindicated.me. Like 
It's a very clever website. Gotcha. Gotcha. I like that. Uh, And we'll have links to all of those over in the show notes. Uh, So, Tintin and Yen, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been an absolute delight. Thank you, Bill. We've had a great time, too. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. I really enjoyed how towards the end of this conversation, the interview also sort of turned into a love letter to Australia, uh, to its people, and, and to its freedoms. It's a wonderful place for Nian and Tintin to do their work to inspire and, and help people around the world going through the toughest moments in their lives. And it also allows them to share beauty with the world at the same time. One of the perks in hosting a podcast is that I do get to talk to fascinating people uh, around the world. I can't imagine how I would have come in contact with Tintin and Yen uh, otherwise without the show. Uh, But seriously, I mean, go ahead and check out the show notes to see a video about the portrait of Tintin on the tram traveling around Melbourne, or to learn more about the palliative care unit or the mobile CT scanner. You can find all those links over at strokecast.com slash power couple. So check it out. You can, of course, also find books by other Strokecast guests and others over at strokecast.com slash gift guide. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.